going to give you some, some key dates for Schaefer and give you sort of an overview of evangelical history in the 20th century, and more particularly uh, Presbyterian history in the 20th century. So uh, in 1924... Go way back to 1924. We had there was a, a document that came out called the Auburn Affirmation. Okay, I don't want you to get too caught up in a lot of these details, but I'm going to give you some details just to sort of fill in the crack of history. Auburn Affirmation was written a document written by some leaders in the uh, in the Presbyterian Church in the North. Okay, Presbyterians. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of splits within the Presbyterian Church here in the 20th century. But the 20th century is not the first place where Presbyterian Church has started to split. They've been split uh, a number of times along various ideological and primarily geographic lines, uh, kind of throughout the course of the history of Presbyterians being in the United States. And the main one's going to be north-south. The main division that we've had has been Presbyterians in the north versus Presbyterians in the south. That lasted the longest and, and made the most impact. So in the northern Presbyterian Church, we had the Auburn Affirmation. There was starting to be some debate in the Presbyterian churches about some of, or how we understand some of, what we can call the basic tenets of Christianity. Things like the, uh, the veracity, the, uh, the reliability, and the authority of the Bible. So there, there were five things that they put out in this Auburn Affirmation that were, that were issues that they wanted to single out. The first was inerrancy, whether or not the Bible has errors. And, and consequently whether it has authority. The second is uh, the virgin birth, whether Jesus was born of a virgin, and consequently whether or not he was divine, he was God. The third, the uh, understanding Jesus' death is a substitutionary atonement, meaning that Jesus dies in the place of you and me, and he gives us, as a, as a function of that, his perfect sinless righteousness. That whether or not Jesus' death can be understood as a substitute. That's the third one. Fourth one is the bodily resurrection. Did Jesus rise physically from the dead? Uh, or is the resurrection to be understood as a metaphor? Uh, and the fifth one is uh, whether or not Jesus did supernatural miracles that actually were against the normal order of things. Okay? There was... There was a division in, in uh, uh, yeah, yeah, division and understanding within leaders of the church and various clergy as to how we are to understand those things. And the Auburn Affirmation was a document that some of these guys put forth and said, we can still be together even though we disagree about these things. So there, there can be a, a big tent in terms of understanding these things. So you can say that the Bible has errors but is still somehow of divine, you know, inspiration, authority in how it moves on you, versus understanding that the Bible is without error and is uh, in, in every, every word, the word of God. And they said that people from, with both of those understandings should be able to stay in the same denomination and submit to the same leadership, and submit to each other's leadership if need be. Okay, so that's the root of some of, of a lot of the things that are going to happen. As a result of this. So far from, you know, a lot of people here in this church, you saw what happened in the 70s uh, with the Southern Presbyterian denomination. Well, this stuff started brewing uh, 50 years beforehand in the Northern denomination. And, and you started seeing a lot of debate about this and, and people being interested in splitting over it. Okay, so once that happens... Uh, some of the observers of Christianity from the evangelical perspective started to realize that it's actually not just a different flavor of Christianity. It's not just redefining some of these terms, but they're still basically the same idea. They started seeing it and said, and said this is actually a different religion. So you had a guy named uh, J. Gresham Machen, is a name that probably some of you have heard, who was a professor of New Testament at Princeton Seminary. Princeton, uh, it's the same town as Princeton University, but a different, different organization. And that is, has been a Presbyterian seminary for 400 years, more than 400 years. Uh, and uh, that's where guys like B.B. Warfield and uh, the A.A. Uh, Hodge and uh, some of these, uh, the Gerhardus Voss, 
some of the big names in American Reformed theology were teachers at, at Princeton Seminary. And he saw this and saw that a whole lot of the people in the seminary and leaders of his denomination were following the new way of understanding it, the, the new theology, they called it. And said, this cannot be, and people in the churches need to be warned about this. So he wrote a book uh, that's become a classic that you can get for free on the internet, if you don't mind reading on a computer, called Christianity and Liberalism. Ever heard that? Ever heard of that book, Christian Liberalism, Christian Machen? It's still worth reading. Uh, very, very much worth reading because it, he's basically still right about the division between uh, conservatives and liberals within, within uh, uh, American churches. So Machen realized that this is an unwinnable war. Uh, or this is, a, this is a situation that cannot stand. You can't have the liberals and conservatives together because their understanding is so different. So in 1929, five years later, he leaves Princeton Seminary and takes the conservative guys that are at the seminary with him, and they form a new seminary in Philadelphia called Westminster Theological Seminary. And probably, there's a good chance you've heard of Westminster Seminary. That's the main seminary that serves uh, American Reformed Evangelicals that you know they put out PhDs and all that. So Machen leaves Westminster, but leaves Princeton, starts Westminster, and starts uh, to see these two sides in, in opposition. And the, there's a motto behind his movement. One of these mottos, we're not sure if he wrote it or, or, or who wrote it, but it's called truth before friendship, which means we need to push for the truth, and that has to supersede our uh, uh, commitments to one another as friends. So we can be friends with these guys, but, that, but we can't let that color our desire to stay together in the same denomination if, if, uh, if these ideologies are so different. All right, so an, another thing that they struggled with is, so there's no formal church split at this point. There's just a seminary split. But there's starting to be an identification of this, you know, group that is left. And their ideology is very different from the ideology of the denomination and the seminary that they just left behind. One of the biggest areas of disagreement is over what's going to be done with missions, missionaries, money that goes overseas. What happens to the money that, that, happen, that goes in the church? Now, those of you that were here uh, around in, in the Aletha Presbyterian circles here in the 70s knew that that was a big reason why the PCA was formed, because they didn't want uh, money that average Joe Christian giving in the place on Sundays going towards, you know, funding guerrillas in Nicaragua or, you know, uh, the Black Panthers or, you know, abortion in Africa and all this stuff, which is stuff that, that a lot of those missions organizations were, were participating in. So they split uh, from the missions board that was associated with the Northern Presbyterian denomination and started what's called the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions in 1933. And that was a declaration of war uh, in the eyes of the denomination. So two years later, in 1935, after undergoing a trial of sorts, in which he was not allowed to testify, Machen was defrocked, and he was you know, stripped of his credentials as a, as, a, as a pastor, and so he said, okay, well, the, the break is here. This is the definitive break. So he started the church that eventually, what we know now uh, to be called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. You all have heard of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church? Uh, there's the only the only congregation for like 200 miles in any direction is two miles east of here. It's called Parkwoods, Parkwoods uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church on, on 133rd and uh, and Quivira, literally just two miles east of here. Um, so that is that, that is a denomination that started, and they were the first uh, to gain like widespread uh, notoriety for it as being a conservative denomination that split away from a mainline denomination among Presbyterians, the OPC. They formally uh, started in, in 1936. Now there's a whole chunk of people that came with them out of the Northern Presbyterian Church. Uh, you had uh, the, the guy who was president of Wheaton College was a guy named J. Oliver Buswell. You may have heard the name Buswell. Uh, you had another guy named Carl McIntyre who uh, became a really important guy in this, in this movement. Because just a year later, Machen uh, got sick and died while on a preaching tour. And so the original intellectual leader and the guy who knew all these people was, sub was suddenly gone, leaving a vacuum in leadership 
and the question of who was going to lead this new movement and under what kind of ideology was very real and very present. Now Mason had tried when he started Westminster to, to sample a kind of a wide amount, a wide array of reformed people. So he had Scottish theologians, uh, kind of American Puritan theologians, and some Dutch guys all coming together to, to teach at Westminster. And so Westminster has been known for the last you know nearly 100 years as uh, as kind of a generally reformed place. It's not. It's not especially Southern Presbyterian. It's not especially Dutch. It's not especially one of these things. It's kind of all of those. So you could come from any one of them. They've never been part of a denomination. So you could be PCA. You could be um, you know, one of the Dutch Reformed denominations. You could be any one of these people and go to Westminster and be okay. Uh, and that caused problems because some of these people said, we got to be Presbyterian with a capital P-R-E-S-B-Y-T-E-R-I-N. You know, not just... Not just providing the leadership, but it's got to be distinctly Presbyterian. So the OPC really started to get this, this identity as, as a, a confessional. You know, they, they held to the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms as their standards. And they wanted to try to be as like the, 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 the Scottish Presbyterians and the English Presbyterians as they could. Now, along with, see, there was nowhere else for conservatives to go. They could either stay in the, in the big liberal denomination, and many of them didn't, or they could go to this splinter group. Now, once they got off on their own, they started to realize that, you know, we're actually not all the same. Like, we're all conservatives. We all agree on these five fundamental things that we see in the, that, that the Auburn Affirmation has a, has a problem with. But there's a lot of other things that divide us. And two of those ones that were really big were... Alcohol use, because we all know that there's there's a significant chunk of American what we could call even fundamentalism that is very against alcohol use, and by extension, you know, dancing, um, cards, uh, going to movies, stuff like that. Uh, so there's a big chunk of them that that's really committed to these kinds of uh, we'll just call it fundamentalist ideals, as well as uh, a particular. Um, theology of what happens in the end times called premillennialism, which means that, that when you read in Revelation 20 about the millennium, that's stuff that happens after Jesus comes back in the future, and we're not living in the millennium now. Now, we're going to get a lot more into that in our fall, fall class on eschatology, but for now, uh, that's the minority view in reform circles. Just so you know, that's a minority view, but it is the majority view among churches that will teach, for lack of a better term, left behind eschatology. Left behind, you know, where you have like the rapture, and, and you're looking for in the newspaper for signs of the times to see what will happen in the future. That characterized these fundamentalist types that are that are in this Presbyterian denomination. So, the next year after Machen died in 1937, almost immediately, those guys started to realize they're not really part of this OPC thing of this Orthodox Presbyterian thing. It's more important to them to have distinctions over, you know, drinking and eschatology than it is to be, you know, to find out what it means to be confessionally reformed in a, in a typical, you know, Scottish sense. We'll say Scottish sense. So they break away just a year later to form what's called the Bible Presbyterian Church. And that's this guy, Carl McIntyre, that I mentioned earlier. He's a name that's going to show up a lot. So McIntyre uh, is friends with Francis Schaeffer. Uh, Francis Schaeffer was a, an up-and-coming guy. He was showing a lot of promise. A uh, fairly young, fairly new believer. Uh, he became a believer through actually reading the Bible to make sure that he didn't disagree, he didn't agree with it after reading secular philosophy. Uh, this is way oversimplified, by the way, just so, you know, <laughs> I'm not giving you an exhaustive account of this stuff. Uh, so he is friends with these guys, and in, in the wake of the loss of Gresham Machen as he died, he goes with his friend, Carl McIntyre, and they break away from the Bible Presbyterian Church, and they broke away from Westminster Seminary as well, because they, well, I'll get into what the, what the issues were or where I got in a minute. And they started another seminary called Faith Seminary. So you see, in a year, we got two, two splits. In, in, in the course of a year. And this is just the start. Okay? So, uh, so Francis Schaeffer leaves with McIntyre and becomes one of the first students to start, to start Faith Seminary. In fact, uh, he was even a student at the time, and they're like, here, grab a truck and a guy 
and we'll give you 15 bucks and you go and find us another seminary campus. And so they went and had a weekend to find another seminary campus. Uh, very interesting story. You, know, you think of seminaries as being this you know, nice place. Well, it was not nice. In terms of the facilities, you know, I'm sure they were nice people. Well, some of them. That's part of that's where we're getting to some of the problems. Um, who here has heard of John Frame? John Frame. Okay, you should become a little bit more familiar with a guy named John Frame. He writes uh, both at a popular level and at a scholarly level. You can find stuff um, going both ways. I've, I've taught some Frame stuff in here before when we did the apologetics class. Frame has an article called Machen's Warrior Children. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating title, Machen's Warrior Children. And he said basically this, the, uh, the group of people that decided to leave the Presbyterian Church kind of had a bee in their bonnet about, about uh, getting things right. They wanted to get things right. Uh, you know, truth before friendship, as they said. So they, once, once they got comfortable with the idea of separating from the church that they came from, they got pretty comfortable with actually the, with the idea of separation in general. And it, wasn't, it was no longer the, the battles over the big picture stuff, like whether or not the Bible is true, and whether or not Jesus you know, performed miracles and was God and born of a virgin. But all of a sudden, they started having huge disagreements over what we might consider minor points. You know? So we might consider, because depending on who you ask, that could be a big deal. So here, here's a list of stuff that he says that has categorized division among Presbyterians and Reformed people ever since then. And you'll be familiar with some of these because we'll talk about them here. They split over eschatology. You know, we already talked about that. Christian liberty, whether or not you could drink or dance. Uh, the incomprehensibility of God and apologetics, meaning like, do, can people understand real thoughts about God? I mean, is, is God so other than us that we can't even, even get anything right? Uh, that was a big deal for them. That was one of the main things that actually started the new seminary, is disagreement over that. Uh, philosophy, the place of philosophy. Uh, how you observe the Sabbath day. Do you do this Sunday a day set aside just for church activities, or can you take a nap, play games with your kids? Uh, charismatic gifts, like speaking in tongues, prophecy, healing. Are those, are those to be completely repudiated, or are they to be uh, at, least, at least put up with? Uh, theonomy, which is uh, the law of the, of the state, should reflect the law of Moses, uh, or at least in its penalties. That the kind of stuff you could be put to death for in the Old Testament could be the kind of things you could be put to death for in America. Which would include things like witchcraft and adultery. So some people really, really wanted that to be the case and wanted Christians to be very active uh, in government to try to get our laws to reflect the, the biblical laws. Uh, concepts of covenant and justification, you don't even want me to go into that. Uh, law and gospel, the position, the, the place of the law in the Christian life. So when you read the law of Moses, is it primarily for, for you to feel guilty so that you'll believe in Jesus? Or is it for other things? And, um, you know, any one of these, if you want more information, ask me later. <laughs> uh, counseling, can you, uh, in counseling, is the Bible sufficient for all, for all of your needs in counseling? Or do we need some psychology? Uh, do we need to, to take some insights from psychology? Huge amount, huge area of disagreement even today. Huge area of disagreement in our presbytery. Huge area of disagreement in this, you know, like five square mile area here. So, uh, length of creation days. This is a huge one in some parts of the country uh, today. There are some um, there are some presbyteries that won't ordain you if you think that it, that it didn't have to be six 24 hour periods. Okay, worship. What's a, what is to be allowed in a worship service? You know, there are some Presbyterians out there that think that you should only sing psalms and you should not use instruments because the New Testament doesn't mention anything other than singing psalms and it doesn't mention using any musical instruments. Uh, that's an extreme example, but there's uh, there's a lot of those guys out there, and then there's a lot of question about how you're supposed to apply that. Roles of women, pretty obvious, but uh, but a lot of it is you know, can women be uh, not only can just women be church officers like pastors and elders and deacons, but can women even teach, uh, teach adult groups? That's a, there's a, still a lot of controversy over that. Uh, preaching and, re and redemptive history. Um, when you give a sermon, what's the place of the Old Testament stuff in the sermon? Is it pointing towards Jesus? There's, as we go on, we get like a little bit more granular. Like some of these things are only, are only um, among pastors or, or, or uh, seminary professors that argue about this stuff. 
but they do. Oh, they argue. <laughs> I've read some articles that are, and they'll tell people that they're not believers if they disagree on some of this stuff. Uh, confessional subscription. When you read the confession and catechisms, do you have to say that you agree with every bit of it, or can you say that, you know, I actually have a problem uh, agreeing totally with this part of it? In the PCA, you are allowed to disagree with some of it. You just have to say what it is that you disagree with. And your presbytery makes a decision for you if it's allowable. There are some people who don't think that should be the case, that you should, you should have to agree with the whole thing. We even have a church here in our presbytery that's very, the pastor is very passionate about that. Uh, church unity. And when they say church unity, we're talking about parachurch organizations. And I'm not talking about like Navigators or Campus Crusade or World Vision. I mean, uh, like the associations that your church belongs to. So like there's the World Council of Churches, you may have heard of those guys. You have the American Council of Churches, you've got uh, the Lausanne Congress. There's all these, uh, there's a North American Presbyterian and Reformed uh, Council Confederation. It starts with a C, it's one of those words, um, that, uh, that the PCA is a part of. Uh, is, it, is it right and desirable for churches that, that can't agree enough to be in the same denomination to nonetheless still join together in some of these larger church things. Some people say no, some people say yes. Uh, tradition and theology. How much does it need to be, does it need to be, our interpretation of the Bible has to supersede everything that all the Christians before us have thought, or how much do we have to take that into account? Uh, then sonship, Christian hedonism, multi-perspectivalism, if you've read John Piper, you're familiar with at least one of those, but... Um, those are some of the issues that, even if you get online today and type in any one of those things, you will find just vitriol, super hot disagreement over some of these things between people in the same denomination, sometimes within the same presbytery, sometimes in the same church, sometimes in the same staff team. So that categorizes, that, that characterizes a lot of a lot of this movement. It's disagreement over a lot of those things and a willingness to to make a make a big fight about it. Some of those things, right, some of those things may be wrong. Uh, you know, try not to do too much editorializing here, um, but there you go. 1938, next year, Schaefer is, is the first graduate of Faith Seminary and the first pastor to be ordained in the, Bible, in the New Bible Presbyterian Church. He gets sent to a city called Grove City, Pennsylvania, and he becomes the pastor of the Bible Presbyterian Church in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Uh, three years later, because one of the elders said that uh, any pastor has said all that they, all that they can say in three years. <laughs> well, three, three years is how long you go to seminary. So uh, by the time you've ended up three years in a pastor, you've said all, the, all that you know. So time for you to move on. Um, which, you know, let's hope that no pastor goes out and just dumps what they are learned in seminary over the course of three years in the church. That doesn't help too many people. He goes and becomes assistant pastor at a church in Chester, Pennsylvania. Uh, serves there for about a year and a half and then moves to St. Louis. And he was the pastor of the first Bible Presbyterian church in St. Louis. Biggest city they lived in at that point, except for his upbringing in uh, Germantown, uh, near, near Philadelphia. <coughs> and in St. Louis, their ministry grew tremendously. At this point, Schaefer is kind of away from some of the big, the big hot stuff in the denomination and is a little bit more free to work on some of the, the local church stuff. And so he and his wife, Edith, uh, really developed a lot of the, the things that would become hallmarks of their ministry, working with young people, uh, both, uh, both youth and children, college students, uh, fostering this idea of uh, honest answers for honest questions. So if you had a question about something you saw in the news or something that you'd read in philosophy or something that these public figures were saying, you know, you could, you could ask it. You'd get an honest answer, you, or at least you'd get an honest I don't know with, uh, with the, the desire to do a little bit more research. So two years later, they started and kind of formally organized this movement called Children for Christ, which actually still is in existence today, even though it's not nearly as large. But they started this uh, writing this curriculum, and it was very transferable. You, you could send it to any church anybody and they could have these lessons now that you could like use with children you just invite your neighborhood kids over and here's the stuff and it was very very successful they would round, um, round up large crowds of children for their summer vacation bible school they kind of started the idea of doing a vacation bible school there in st louis as well as these home groups during the week <clears throat> interestingly enough schaefer 
was a part of this very, very, very um, contentious uh, fundamentalist Presbyterian movement. He, he had allied himself with the ones who were, who were uh, interested in splitting over some of these issues. And so part of their ethos was, was, was this, uh, this tension between wanting to go out there and work in the community and like gather a wide amount of people, but, a, but an unwillingness to work with other Christians that weren't like they were. You see, because they were very interested in, in splitting off formally from them denominationally. So they had, a, they had a policy where they would not share their curriculum with other denominations. It had to be this separatist group that could get, that could get the material. Now, the material was not geared towards that group of people. It was geared towards kids from the neighborhood. But they always felt uneasy about that, and he, he's, he's, he's uh, written about that, that he, they, had, they were uncomfortable uh, with that, but it, it was more in line with the, with the stuff that they were doing. Uh, a couple of years later, he was tapped by, their, by the denomination's missions organization to take a tour of Europe and see what, the, what was going on in Europe in the wake of World War II. This is less than two years after World War II is over, and he tours all over Western Europe and sees terrible, terrible, terrible things. And also a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, promise and potential as well. The evangelicals over there are doing good work. So uh, the next year he gets tapped and they say, you you got to move over to Europe and be your missionaries over over to this, this, this torn place. Very, very, very few evangelicals in Europe anyway, and so very, very, very few people that Schaefer can work with because he's working with a subset of a subset of a subset of evangelicals, and they won't cooperate with other people. He sees pretty early on that there's a that there's a lot of limitations to this uh, to this approach, uh, and one of the one of the big formative events for him is uh, if, if you all have heard of Karl Barth, he's he's a fairly well known name. He was a theologian in Switzerland uh, and was known for trying to uh, you know in a general way kind of recast what the Christian faith looked like and what these definitions meant to better work well with uh, the philosophy going on in the wider world. Some people would say he was just straight up unchristian because he actually changed a lot of the stuff, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the key doctrines. His doctrine of scripture, his doctrine of Christology, his doctrine of all this stuff was very different from what you'll hear, um, at least here in this church. But he and a bunch of his friends, including Buzzwell, who was the guy who was president of Wheaton College, they met with Barb one afternoon <clears throat> and just just let him have it um, in a combative way. You know, they spent a few hours with him, and, and one of Schaefer's uh, enduring impressions was how kind and how patient Bart was with these guys who really were there to interrogate him. And you know, later on, he sent he sent him. Here's my write up based on you know what we talked about. And Bart was very unhappy with it, but uh, but still answered them graciously, and that really shook him. And they saw this guy that he was very interested in letting the whole world know was this, you know, uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, this, this unregenerate man out there teaching theology who exhibited <clears throat> a lot of the traits of what Schaefer thought the Christian life was supposed to be like, kindness, patience, generosity, more than the guys he was working with, who supposedly had all their stuff right. So that was a big, a, a big thing for him. So starting a couple years later, uh, in 1950, 1951, 1952, Schaefer has this spiritual crisis where he goes, you know, do I believe this stuff? Is this stuff really true? And so he, he by his own admission, he undoes all of his theology and starts back at the beginning and starts asking himself this, the most basic questions. How, you know, what is truth? How do we know it? You know, all the stuff that he actually ends up dealing with in, in detail in his later books. And, and winds up coming back to the conclusion that he had before. The Christian faith is, is right. It's right because it's true. It's true because it actually describes reality in a way that other world systems don't. So this is right. This is true. Because it's right, because it's true, it should produce in the people who believe it the stuff that it says it's going to. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, fruit of the Spirit. Uh, standard, standard Bible teaching. Well, he wasn't seeing that. In his uh, in his community, he wasn't seeing that, especially in Carl McIntyre, the guy who who had started the denomination that he was in and started the seminary. And at some point, the Bible Presbyterian Church, surprised to no one, splits into two denominations: uh, a Columbus Synod and another one. I can't remember what city it was, but but Schaefer goes with the one 
that McIntyre wasn't in at that point. And McIntyre, uh, it, uh, it, there's a, uh, uh, I didn't bring it here with me, but, uh, no, here it is. This is a biography of Schaefer written by one of his students, Colin Duryea, it's a very good book. But he, he details in there that uh, McIntyre was, became kind of a McCarthy figure, just a McCarthy figure, and called Schaefer publicly a communist. Uh, when the church when the church divided, and Schaefer decided not to go with not to go with McIntyre, so he starts giving these lectures on what became the book True Spirituality, which is what we're going to go through. But he worked on that for almost 20 years. He starts giving these lectures in 1953 uh, and publishes the book in 1971. And he's very concerned with truth being the foundation for the Christian faith. Okay, it's got to be true. It's got to be real. Like we're not just we're not just describing our experience here. We're talking about stuff that's really real in the world. And there's love that needs to flow from that. A love for fellow man, a tenderness, a compassion that he, that he was finding in short supply. So he splits from McIntyre's denomination, the missions agency. He resigns from, from the missions agency in 1955-56. Um, starts Labrie, which is what he's most well known for, at the shelter of uh, basically a retreat center in, uh, in Switzerland where you could go and ask honest questions and get honest answers for them. And starts his, his uh, uh, he's already been doing an itinerant preaching and speaking ministry, but this really took off at this point, speaking all over the world, uh, bringing this message and, and his approach all over the world. Uh, the next year, Covenant College and Covenant Seminary, uh, no stranger to us here, uh, started in 1956 in uh, St. Louis. They were founded by the, by. So Buswell and McIntyre split. McIntyre was the other one, Buswell's this one. They start Covenant College and Seminary. So you'll have a Buswell Library, actually, at both Covenant College and Covenant Seminary. And this is still part of one of those splinter denominations. But they change. You know, they learn and move on. And so they started making nice with some of these other splinter denominations out there. And they eventually formed uh, a denomination that in 1983 uh, joined with the PCA. Uh, and Schaefer became a pastor in the PCA, um, even while he was out, you know, in, in the break. And then the next year he died of cancer. Uh, but that's where Schaefer kept his ties. He kept his ties in that denomination. So we, as a result, here in the PCA, get to, you know, kind of claim Schaefer uh, because we were, were part of the tradition that, 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 that took him in. So that's, and that's just the north, by the way. The, so like I said there's a split between north and south. This is all north stuff. South stuff uh, develops later. And that's, you know, in a large part where, where this church kind of gets its start. This church uh, um, here, New Hope, joined the PCA before, before those northern denominations did. It's a little bit of a different story. But uh, here, I'm going to read you an excerpt from a letter that Francis Schaeffer wrote. This is in 1955, right after he resigns from the missions agency. And he's really taking a hard look at what his life has been like the last, you know, handful of years being part of this separatist movement. He says, I wish we could have time to talk and pray together, but we do want you to know we felt very much increasingly it's a deep spiritual principle that Christians shouldn't vindicate themselves. So make excuses for things they did wrong. Um... It seemed to us that the fever sending out of some of these letters uh, and published, published publicly, which has become so much a part of the separated movement, is kind of the antithesis of this principle when one's own person is involved. So through the last 13 months, we've asked God to exhibit through us the same mind that he exhibited when he didn't answer his enemies. This has been most difficult at times, as you know, especially when half-truths, which are really deceptions, really deceptions of a serious sort, and they're used not against our work in judgment, but also our character. On the other hand, it's quite clear that the flesh can always find an excuse for answering in any particular instance. So he's starting to see that, that there's a lot of excuses being made for, for wrongs done. And he's like, you know, that's, that actually doesn't work with, uh, with how Jesus was. He says, it's seen, and then he talks about the, the reality of the Christian life, that there's a, a real experience of this. He says, it seems to me there's three external observable results that flow from a proper internal spiritual reality. You know, when you're right with God and you're experiencing the gospel, there should be three external results. First, an outreach and evangelism, which is clearly not a result of human talent and energy. Second, an external exhibition 
uh, a certain external exhibition presented. So, so I'm thinking, for example, of of an expansion of, and he said he names a couple of, uh, of uh, mercy ministry organizations. Just third, as you read the writings of, of of this particular circle of people, and he's talking about um, the people in in Wales that were part of a of a revival. As you read their writings, you, you find a remarkably clear combat arising against liberal Protestantism. So the kind of fight that we're engaged in, there's a, there's a fight against the liberals because you know that it's a different religion. Okay, so he says this combat had great strength. <clears throat> so, but even at the time of the Welsh Revival, when this was happening, those involved recognized Satan was disrupting the full realization of fruit by producing counterfeit expressions of external, of external, external science. So all those three things, so you have evangelism happening that's not a result of human energy, you have uh, an increase in some of these mercy ministry sorts of things, and you have a fight against liberalism, that there's counterfeit expressions of those as well as the real ones. He says, which is found in the, uh, in the rising flood of Pentecostalism. It's quite clear that Satan used this counterfeit to rob Wales of all that would have been expected from the Welsh Revival. And here's where he gets personal. He says, it seems to me that we who are living 50 years after that have seen the rise of counterfeits in not just one of those points, but all three. And it has been my sober conclusion that the counterfeit to number three, the fight against liberal Protestantism, has been ourselves. I've realized before the face of the Lord that the so-called separated movement is a part of this. This does not mean that I question the salvation of the individuals who are involved in these counterfeits, but I do believe that the only solution is to get back to the spiritual correctness of those who lived 50 years ago in the circle I mentioned above. Perhaps the greatest tragedy in this whole manner is that the Christians of our generation have tended to be repulsed from the scriptural position of the purity of the visible church because of the counterfeit. But who can blame the Christian world from being repulsed rather than drawn to purity in the church when they observed what has occurred in the orbit of those who claim to represent the scriptural principle? Those who have any sensitivity to New Testament Christianity are naturally going to be completely repulsed by the failure to show forth God's love in any way, and by the devouring criticism leveled against those who would speak for a balance in showing forth the love of God and the holiness of God. So because Schaefer was, was arguing for a balance between the holiness and the love stuff, that's what got him branded a communist by, uh, by McIntyre. And then uh, he says, Edith, and this is a personal letter to someone, so he's always you know, talking about, oh, she wants to say this. Edith thinks I should add one more thing, so there's no possibility of misunderstanding. This is as follows. As Pentecostalism stresses external signs without an internal reality, you know, you can get all worked up without really actually believing, and without having this be a reality in your, in your heart. So also the separated movement stresses certain external and minute forms of separation from organizational unbelief without resting this on the supernatural, internal, spiritual realities. Because of this, the separated movement excuses all sorts of other things which strike down both the exhibition of the love of God and His holiness. That kind of horror in his realization of what he'd been part of was really the foundation for true spirituality. So he says you have to have the truth, you have to have the... the the reality of the philosophy and how all this stuff really works with the Bible, and you have to have love. So he has um, true spirituality is often viewed as as like the counterpart to his apologetics books, which are very heavy on philosophy, very heavily and very heavy on history, in showing why people think the way they do, why and why Christianity is true. And along with that, you have to see that understanding that produces a real result of love and charity in your life.